previously we discussed this problem in which we have a road in which we're looking down on from above and there's this car driving on the road driving along this windy path and we were asking about its acceleration and in that discussion we talked about acceleration from a qualitative perspective now I actually want to quantify acceleration just as a reminder of what we did before let's recall that if the car is traveling along this curvy path at a constant speed, it still has an acceleration, right? Even though the speed is constant, uh, we get an ex centripetal acceleration that's perpendicular to the path, pointed towards the center of the curvature. Why did we get that? Well, here's a picture of that first left turn and that first curve. Although the speed of the car is constant, look at it, its velocity vector is changing because the direction of travel of the car is changing, right? And because the velocity vector is changing, we get an acceleration, the centripetal acceleration towards the center. In general, however, as the, as the object is moving along this curved path, there are two components of acceleration. One is the centripetal component that we just talked about. It's the component perpendicular to the path. That's due to the fact that the velocity vector is changing its direction. But we also get a component of acceleration tangent to the path. That's this one right here that arises because the object, in this case the car, could be changing its speed. It could be ch speeding up or slowing down. That will give the, the tangential component of the acceleration. So this leads us naturally to the topic of path coordinates. And what we want to do is we want to, we want to express acceleration, velocity, and other quantities of interest in the path coordinates. What are path coordinates? So in path coordinates what we do is we define basis vectors as follows. We have uh, one basis vector in the direction tangent to the path and another basis vector in the direction perpendicular to the path. And these basis vectors change depending upon where you are on the path. So if I'm right here in the path, you know, tangent is this way, perpendicular is that way. But as I move along the path, my direction, which is tangent, changes, right? And this e hat n direction, it's always pointed in the direction perpendicular to the path, as we said. But also the positive e hat n direction is defined so that it points towards the center of curvature. Now if I want to write my velocity in terms of path coordinates, it's actually real easy. Because remember, velocity is always tangent to the path. So we just say this is, so it's all in the e hat t direction. I'll say v in the e hat t direction, where v is the speed, right? It's the scalar rate of travel, in meters per second, or miles per hour, or feet per, per year. Now the acceleration is a little bit more complicated. It has two components, right? has a component tangent to the path, as we just discussed a second ago, and it also has a component perpendicular to the path, or a component in the e hat n direction. Now this component in the tangential direction is actually quite easy. Let me just write that down here. Remember, we have tangential component of acceleration due to the fact that the, the object, or in this case the car, is speeding up or slowing down. It's due to the fact that the speed is changing. So that component of the acceleration is just v dot. But what about the other component of acceleration? Remember that comes from the, the fact that the velocity vector is changing its direction. So the way we write this piece, is it's a little more complicated, so let's discuss it more deeply. So one of the important geometric constructs we're going to need for this discussion is that of circumference and arc length of a circle. So what I've done here is I've drawn a circle that's supposed to sort of coincide with this path as the car moves from point C to point D. And let me see if you can recall something for me. Let's suppose that the radius of this circle is r. Now given that, what is the circumference of the circle? I'm hoping that you remember that the circumference is 2 times pi times that radius right here. And we'll use that result to say something a little more, more interesting, I think. So let me just draw a line right there. And let me furthermore define an angle. I'll call it theta. Now if I want to know the arc length of this part of the circle right there, just uh, you know, along that circular path, let me call it s, then how do I get that? Well the way you get it is you recognize that theta is just some, some fraction of the 2 pi r, and this, this little arc length, I guess it could have been a name, call it s, is some fraction of the total circumference, and recognizing that you can hopefully easily see that s equals r times theta, where theta is measured in radians, right? So if theta is the full 2 pi, in other words, all the way around the circle, then, then r times 2 pi would be that total circumference, what we see here. But if theta is some fraction of the 2 pi, then s is the corresponding fraction of the total circumference. 
So given that, let's go back to my centripetal acceleration. We've got this car traveling along this curved part of the road. At some point A, it has a velocity V at TA. At some point B, it has a velocity V at TB. Again, I'm considering, at least for the moment, that uh, speed is constant. So the difference in velocities is this guy right here. We divide it by the time difference. We get that one right there. If we take the limit as these two times approach each other, that's my acceleration. We get an acceleration perpendicular to the path. Now what if, here's my what if, we'll do a little thought experiment. What if I double the speed of my car? So in blue here, I have my original velocity vector. I, I like to put down there for reference. Now, if I'm going twice as fast, my velocity vector at, at point A, or at time A, TA, is going to be twice as big, right? So the new velocity vector is indicated here in green. Now I ask, what's my velocity vector at time TB? Well, the time from TA to TB hasn't changed. It's only the velocity has changed, or the speed has changed. It's twice as much. So in going in, in between time A and time TB, the car has gone twice the distance than it did originally. So the velocity at time B is going to be this vector right here in green, whereas my original one was this blue one. Ooh, this is getting interesting. So now if I form my vector triangle uh, to get my velocity differences, I get this one, right, where my, my vectors, again, these vectors are enlarged from what I had here. But here's my, my new velocity at time A my new velocity at time b, this one right here, and the difference is this orange one right there. And notice the orange one, the new velocity difference, is much bigger than the old velocity difference that I put here in red for reference. In fact, I can take uh, copies of these red ones and sort of stack them end to end and see that the new uh, velocity difference is about four times as big as the original one. Now the fact that my new velocity difference is a lot bigger comes from two different things happening here. One is that these velocity vectors are twice as big. So if we just consider the effect of being twice as big, what's going on? You know, the fact that they're twice as big means that my, my, my new velocity difference is about twice as big. But also this angle is bigger as well. How much bigger is the angle? Well, let's go back over here. Remember, we're traveling twice the distance. Since we're going twice the speed, we're traveling twice the distance along the circular path in that little bit of time between TA and TB. Since we're traveling twice the dif distance on that circular arc, the angle that we, that we go across is also twice as big. And that angle, this alpha right here is the alpha right there, and this alpha prime right here is the alpha prime right there. So this angle right here, the angle between my new larger velocity vectors, is twice as big. So I get a doubling because I've doubled the size of my, my velocity vectors, and I have also get a doubling because I've doubled this angle right here. So doubling happens twice, that, that makes things four times as big, and hence, my velocity difference is four times as big as it was before. In my definition of acceleration, I'm, I take this velocity difference and I divide by a time difference. The time difference hasn't changed at all, right? The time between point A and point B or time between point A prime and point B prime, it's the same. So I'm taking a, a four times bigger velocity difference, dividing by the same amount of time, hence my acceleration is roughly four times bigger, at least in I haven't even taken a limit yet. When I do take that limit, it's exactly four times bigger. So now let's start filling in this piece here. So our normal component of acceleration, perhaps we're understanding it a little bit better. We don't know what it's actually equal to yet, but we can say that it's sort of proportional to speed squared, right? If I double my speed, I quadruple my acceleration. So here's our result so far, and let's explore a little bit more. So the next thing I want to look at is the tightness of the turn. So if we go back to this road that I drew before, notice that this first left turn is rather gentle, at least compared to the, the subsequent right turn. The right turn's a little more uh, sharp. So the way I'm going to quantify the sharpness of the turn is by the turn radius. This particular turn right here is a circular arc, and the center of that circle is up here. It has a radius RAB. This turn over here also is a circular arc, but a smaller radius, it centers, the center of that circle is right here. In fact, I've drawn these in a way, I'm not sure if you can see it, is that this radius right here is exactly half of the radius uh, for the other one, just for an, a nice comparison. So for each of these turns, I want to draw one of these uh, velocity triangles. 
So just as we've done before, let TA and TB denote two times. The velocities of the two times are indicated here. I've enlarged the velocities just so I can see them a little bit better. There's the difference between the velocity. And similarly, for when we're going through that right turn, I've got two velocities at time TC and time TD. There's my two different velocities, and the difference between those velocity vectors is that one. Now I've noticed that the the distance between TA and TB is the same as the distance between TC and TD. I very, very carefully constructed these. And since we're going at a constant speed throughout this, that means the time difference is the same for each one of these. Now recall that the distance traveled in going from point C to point D is just, I'll call that S, is equal to R, the radius of the circle, times this angle theta right here. Now in both cases, uh, the distance traveled and going from A to B is the same as the distance from C to D. But the radii are different. This one has a much longer radii. Or the radius of this arc is twice as long as the radius of that one. So therefore, the th since the distance traveled is the same, and the radius is different by a factor of 2, that the, ang the angle theta must also be different by a factor of 2. In other words, the theta for this case must be half as big as the theta for this case. And we see that right here. The theta right here is the same as the beta right there. So this angle alpha is half as large as this angle beta. And perhaps it's not surprising. What I did is I took this, this little velocity difference right here and just copied it over here. I've got two copies right here. And, then, and we see that this velocity difference is about twice as big as this velocity difference. In fact, right here, it's just an approximation. But if I take the limit as these times approach each other, then it becomes exact. So what we have here is the acceleration, the centripetal acceleration inward along this tight turn is about twice as big as the centripetal acceleration inward along this shallower turn. There's a two to one relationship because the radii are in a two to one relationship. So going back to my expression for the centripetal component of acceleration over here, I already found previously that the acceleration goes like speed squared. But now, how does the radius of the circular path appear in my, in my expression? Remember, if I, make, if I have the radius, so if I make the radius half as big, my acceleration gets twice as big. So how does the r fit into this? Take a second to think about it before, uh, before watching further. So the way to get this correspondence to work out right is if we divide by the radius, right? If we make the radius half as big as it was before, dividing by one half makes the acceleration twice as big. Or if I make the radius twice as big, the acceleration becomes half as big. It's this relationship right here that I think makes sense with our little thought experiment that we just ran through. Now, a good thing to check, I always like to look at units, right? So what if we look at the units of what we have here? Speed is a length per time, and I'm squaring that thing, and I'm dividing by a length. So what I have here is a length, try to squeeze this in, over time squared. And that's exactly what we want from acceleration. It's a length per time squared, meters per second squared, feet per hour squared. So I think I'm relatively happy with this. Acceler centripetal acceleration goes like speed squared divided by a radius. Now I said goes like. We just sort of did a semi-derivation uh, based upon how things, how we expect things to change as we double certain quantities. Now it could be a two times velocity squared over radius or, or a third speed squared divided by a radius. Uh, we don't know, at least based upon our derivation so far. So to actually get it right, you have to do you have to actually go into the derivation a little more deeper than we did. I don't feel like doing that, at least for path coordinates. We'll do it when we go to polar coordinates and we'll see that how it actually works out. So for now, let me just tell you the result. And the result is exactly what we've written down here. So so instead of writing a goes like, I'm going to put a strict equality in here. The normal component of acceleration is equal to speed squared divided by radius. And again, we'll actually verify this rigorously when we go to polar coordinates. And that concludes our discussion right here.